Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Books do not simply appear. Someone must undertake the task to sit down and compose the words on the page for another person to read. And that's the main purpose of a book, to be read, to convey information to another individual so that they might learn or be entertained, or in some cases both. A book is a vessel, and the person who opens that vessel is meant to consume the contents within, which is what makes the Voynich Manuscript such a complex and strange volume. It was discovered by an antiquarian bookseller named Wilfred Voynich in 1912. It had been passed down through the ages, from Holy Roman emperors to doctors to Czech collectors, going missing for two centuries until finally ending up in the hands of Voynich. He purchased it in a small Italian village and brought it back to London, where he kept it hidden for several years. Then, in 1915, Voynich decided to reveal the manuscript to the world, and scholars were befuddled by it. Measuring roughly the size of a standard modern hardcover, the book is comprised of 240 vellum pages bound within a goatskin binding. In 2009, radiocarbon dating tests pegged its creation to sometime in the early 1400s. Almost every page is adorned with paintings and drawings of flowers, mythological creatures, buildings, and people. Oh, and text. Text that no one can read. Some words are written in Latin but the majority of the text is written in an unknown language. It has been studied continuously since Voynich first uncovered the manuscript over a century ago, and no one has successfully deciphered its contents. It's even been studied by NSA cryptographers, who believe the manuscript was written in a European language that had been converted using a kind of cipher to obscure the text. Others, though, say that the words are really codes that required a separate book to translate properly. One man who examined the book in 1943 claimed that it was actually a diary written in a special shorthand only understood by the original author. However, historians quickly debunked that theory, citing that the abbreviations used in the book weren't based on any known style or form. Scientists, students, and scholars looked at everything. The arrangement of the text, the number of letters and words in each line, how each letter was formed, and still came away knowing no more than they did before they laid eyes on it. One of the more prominent theories came from a television writer and historian named Nicholas Gibbs. He'd been contacted to examine the manuscript as part of a project he was working on for a UK television show. He published his findings on a prominent literary website where it was picked up by countless outlets across the internet. By all accounts, he'd done what no one else could do. He had solved the mystery. Now, according to Gibbs, many of the Latin abbreviations had been used in 15th century medical texts about herbs. The idea that the book had been written in a kind of code or cipher had been incorrect. All it was, was medical shorthand. And not only that, but many of the diagrams within the book matched diagrams in other medical texts that Gibbs had consulted, leading him to believe the manuscript had been a specially created document for one specific reader who wanted all of their necessary information stored within one book. The Voynich manuscript predates the printing press by a few decades, so books of that time had to be reproduced manually. Gibbs claimed this particular manuscript had been a greatest hits album of other textbooks pertaining to herbal medicine and gynecology. Sadly, his treatise would quickly become a target of criticism, and soon after it was published, medievalists dug in. They ripped apart his theory, mainly about how he interpreted the Latin abbreviations. No one within the historical community took him seriously. And just like that, everyone was back to square one. Things got so desperate at one point that rumors circulated that the book was a fake, fabricated by Voynich himself using his vast knowledge of antique books and bookmaking. Historians, though, have ruled that idea out due to the age and provenance of the vellum, Finding so many pages from a single source would have been nearly impossible, even for a dealer such as Voynich. And so, for now, 
the Voynich Manuscript remains an unsolved literary mystery. Theories seem to be debunked as soon as they are offered, but for anyone wanting to try their luck, they'll have to pay a visit to Yale University. That's where the book is housed today, within its rare book and manuscript library, under the call number MS408. And if you manage to sit in front of it, happy reading. Music has a way of affecting people like nothing else. Hearing an old song can transport a person back to their childhood, drumming up feelings of wistfulness or pain. Love songs can ignite romance on a starlit night, or regret for something lost. Music has always been equated with magic, and in some ways it really is. In others, it's a poison that can bring a person lower than they've ever thought possible. Founding father Benjamin Franklin learned about this more sinister side of music the hard way. Franklin was a bit of a renaissance man, with his interest extending from politics to art to literature and to music. A friend of his, Edward Delaval, played a unique kind of instrument, one that captivated Franklin from the first note. He called it a glass harp, and it wasn't really an instrument at all, at least not in the traditional sense. It didn't use strings or a reed to generate sound. It was nothing more than a table of glass cups filled to different levels with water. Delaval would wet his finger and rub it along the rim of each glass one at a time, which would generate a tone. Franklin was enchanted by the gentle hums from Delaval's harp, so he set out to make one for himself. His idea was to construct the table of goblets into something that would fit in a box and could be easily transported for travel. He worked with the local glass blower to create glass bowls of various sizes. Arranged on an iron rod horizontally, each bowl would play a single note when touched by a wet finger. A foot pedal would spin the whole contraption, allowing Franklin to simply shift his hands when he wanted to play different notes. The novel new design actually allowed him to play up to 10 notes at the same time, much like a piano. He dubbed his creation the Glass Harmonica. Yes, just like Harmonica, another name it often went by. He debuted his Glass Harmonica in 1762, and it took off with audiences immediately. The sound was unlike anything anyone had ever heard, and its popularity grew so quickly that legends like Mozart and Beethoven even composed music for it. However, not everyone found the Glass Harmonica a soothing experience. Its otherworldly tones didn't sit well with some listeners, who spoke of dizziness, stomach aches, fainting, and, in some extreme cases, permanent nerve damage. Even worse were the psychological problems associated with its music. Both listeners and players were known to suffer from depression, suicidal thoughts, and some even had to be committed to sanitariums for delusions, and all of it was attributed to listening to this instrument. During one performance in Germany, a child died after prolonged exposure to its music. The more spiritually minded believed its high-pitched notes could summon the ghosts of the dead. In reality, it was science that held the answers. It turns out that the tones produced by the device occurred at such a range, the human ear was unable to detect their origin. This disorientation combined with the surreal nature of the notes themselves may have been what had created such discomfort in audiences. It had also been suspected that lead in the glass may have caused sickness in anyone who touched the bowls, but those claims were never confirmed. Most agree that the trace amounts that would have been present could not have been enough to trigger lead poisoning. Regardless of the science, these symptoms and stories led to the belief that the glass harmonica was cursed, which led to its eventual decline. Except in the case of Benjamin Franklin, he never experienced any of the instrument side effects and continued to play it until his death in 1790. He was quoted as saying, Of all my inventions, the glass harmonica has given me the greatest personal satisfaction. Unfortunately, no one else felt the same. Over half a century after its debut, not a single musician was still playing the glass harmonica. Musical tastes had moved on. New instruments were cropping up, ones whose notes could fill a concert hall without creating psychological damage in the listener. 
5,000 glass harmonicas were made during the 1700s, and today, only a handful still remain. A replica of the one Franklin played is on display at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. You can visit it if you want to see it. Surprisingly, though, the instrument has seen a kind of resurgence, most notably among film composers. In fact, thanks to composer James Horner, millions of people around the world have heard the otherworldly tones of the glass harmonica without knowing it. And the song? It's simply called Spock, a theme for the same character in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. A good choice, and one, I might add, that is most logical. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Stay curious.